Thanks for coming. I'm, of course, Mark Whitaker. I've got a small sheet of one page, both sides, that may help understand a few things about this work. Because later it gets very numerical and statistical on the back. And it's just easier to get something to look at instead of having one glance at it at one time. I need another one too. So, it's already a bit past time. I'll go ahead and begin. Hi, Dr. Mark Whitaker, assistant professor here. Thanks for coming to hear this talk. This is actually uh, group research with Dr. Brown, as it shows here, uh, in process for publication. This is a survey instrument that we have conducted for over two years at least. Let's say that over two years. But um, I am giving this presentation instead of her, mostly because one of the things of the many things we're researching is very striking. And since it was my idea, we agreed that I would be the lead author on this idea. And we've been polishing this at least for over, what, a year and a half, you'd say? Yeah, <laughs> at least. Um, but here's an interesting image. Let's start on that. This is typically the way most people think about mobile addictions, right? The phone taking over your hand, right? The assumption is the causal factor is these phones. So we're going to have an open debate here, and the, the survey that we have is sort of testing this idea, which is causing which? Are people reaching for the phone out of their psychological problems, or is the phone really a physiological addiction? And this is a nice meme that I found, you know, probably the saddest picture ever taken. You can't see what that is. It's children that should be playing on this jumping slide. But um, instead, they're all locked into these uh, screens, right? But since I teach mobile development, I think this is probably the most hopeful picture ever taken. This is from uh, 2017 in Barcelona. It's probably over 100, you know, 1.6 million people, maybe near the same number of smartphones, for protest the Spanish jailing of elected leaders uh, in Barcelona. So. Um, what will happen, you know, we'll both will be locked in, but we'll also be locked in network together <coughs> at, a, at a higher rate than before. So you might say there's an ambivalence I have about mobile development, that there's potentially great problems of addictions um, if they're physiological, if they're physically connected to the phone. But there's also a lot of positive social development that comes with this particular technology and medium. But these talks uh, that I helped arrange for everyone are about current research only, so uh, first, uh, for a few minutes, I want to introduce myself and these ongoing hybrid interscientific things that I research. And mobile addiction, as you can imagine, is just one of these interscientific topics. But, and of course, just to reiterate, I'm assistant professor here at the Department of Technology and Society. Uh, my education is in sociology, officially. But um, my interests are in environment, technology, and society interaction. And this place in Wisconsin is one of the few places to study environmental sociology at any large school. There's other places like Vanderbilt University that have an undergraduate program, but not a, a graduate program per se, and definitely not where the entire department is named that. You know, it's not just an emphasis on that. It, the whole department's name is Community and Environmental Sociology. It's a very large department, and typically very obsessive place, as you can imagine for several generations. So I was in the crucible of obsessive sociologists interested in environmental problems, and I think mobile phones are one potential environmental problem. Um, my pre-doctorate education, of course, master's in science and sociology, but I have a very wide historical purchase in world comparative religious studies. It's one of the few also departments where you can study this outside of a the uh, theology degree. Um, it's a secular degree. It's not part of a priesthood or a Buddhist monastery, Sangha. It's basically uh, a comparative religious studies, which has been going on since the 1800s, uh, like Joachim Bach and all these other people. But anyway, um, it's the secular study of religious structures. Um, also have a concentration in world history in East Asia, which is prescient because guess where I am now? Uh, in East Asia, of course, right in the middle in Korea. But um, why am I interested in mobile phone? This less reductionistic hybrid topic. 
I, here's too complicated phrase with a hyphen. I'm a comparative historical environmental sociologist. And that's very interdisciplinary. Um, also, I'm interested in more general theoretical issues about society, technology, and environmental issues, but know a lot about very specific things dealing with particular technologies. And by that long phrase, though, I mean I'm interested in breaking two dichotomies of analysis. One, comparative historical. That's the first half of this phrase. And uh, I'm equally nomothetic and ideographic. If anybody's not heard of those terms, those are popularized back in the 1890s before the social sciences really coalesced as a separate field. And uh, people who are nomothetic, they look for generalizations. You're constantly searching for some general theory. Ideographic is like a historian that wants to look at only the records of this small town in France and discuss the financial dealings of the Miller over 150 years and his family relationships. And that's for him for the real thing, because cases are real. He's not looking for theory. But you know, most people are trained in only one or the other. But I have a background in history as well as sociology. And um, typically, these are versus each other instead of wedding their skills together. Economists and sociologists, as I said, look for more nomothetic similarities and regularly shun case studies based on ideas of uniqueness. Um, historians respect, and I respect that, respect ideographic case studies and mostly dislike even applying a theory. They think theories can never capture the nuance of a particular historical case. Um, on the other half of this phrase, environmental sociologists, you know, biophysical scientists are interested in the wider natural and chemical world. And typically, you know, they're not interested in humans at all, unless it's the medical effect of that, or humans are just one particular species. And environmental analysis is all about everything except what is human and social. Meanwhile, the social sciences, which are sort of coalesced around these ideographic, excuse me, more nomothetic disciplines, prefer to neuter their analysis in the opposite direction. They only want to look for social facts. So if one only one who looks at the biological aspects, the other really wants to look at us as exclusively a social animal and not as a biological creature. Um, and typically, at least from Durkheim in the early 20th century, the whole structure of sociology is looking for social facts, as they're called. And that means something exclusively separate from material world things, something exclusively separate from technology that's an independent variable that causes other social things. It's a kind of a closed loop where social facts are presumed to only relate to other social facts. Here's some examples of things you probably could see in a social science journal, like role of proletarianization in urbanization. One social thing upon another social thing. Inheritance and effects upon the intergenerational transfer of wealth. Location of crime uh, related to other social factors. Uh, sociological analysis historically was almost everything except environmental. And really sociology pulled away from a very genetic and geographical determinism in the early 20th century. And the discipline was sort of founded intentionally as a lobotomy against what was very popular. And what was very popular was the idea that, well, society is just genetic. Um, there's a genetic structure of this, and that's why we're social. And Durkheim was really the first to argue there's, that may be true, but there's autonomous social things that cause things too, and he just wants to focus on those. Um, but in my hybridity, here's some of the things I typically study, which sort of blend all those four areas. We've got biophysical material variations in urban textiles, comparatively. That was a called Raw Materials and the Division of Labor. Um, I've studied comparative historical environmental degradation processes based on similar and different social material choices. I've also studied general social addiction here about particular kinds of technologies in the mobile phone, and that's this study here. But um, you know, if we live in a hybrid world, everything you look at from this cup of tea to this computer are not exclusively physical, they're not exclusively one or the other. This is a social structure. Even the water has been socially filtered so it doesn't have other biological contaminants in it. So everything about the world is really a hybrid. But our disciplines, we are growing up in, in, in educated disciplines that don't encourage us to think like that. We are told to think exclusively about only the physical things of the tea, not about, you know, <coughs> the different varieties of water across the world based on social regulations, uh, different systems. Um, those kind of things fascinate me, but 
if all topics are scientific, then there are bits of social, biological, and physical in everything. A good example would be the, a bottle of wine. You know, you think a bottle of wine is, you know, biology of the grape, right? Well, it took a lot of knowledge to understand how to have exclusively alcohol and not many other things in there. Wine are really the art of the vintner. It's really not just the grapes guy. Grapes taste awful off the vine. It depends on the soil, it depends on the climate. So, but if you change one thing, you will change the hybrid. If you change this, like, if you change, you know, the tax rates, you know, on, on wineries, you probably have the farmer make different biological and physical decisions. So my point is, I often think about this model in my causal hypotheses, that they're all interactive and that the real world hybrid is tweaked by a change in any of these sub factors like that. And of course, that should be my coat of arms, right? <laughs> but other hybrid topics of my interest, uh, two books, Toward a Bioregional State, I wrote that before the dissertation, and my dissertation was published after the year I uh, got my PhD in 2009, it's called Ecological Revolution. I got a US National Science Foundation Award uh, for that kind of a applied implications of policy issues. Um, I wrote a very interesting article uh, with an uh, IWA professor, IWA Yojo de Hapio. That's the first school that I was here for three or more years there and continued to collaborate with them even after I left. But we got a nice, very friendly Korean National Science Foundation grant award for that article. Um, this is where I'm going in NYC in two weeks with Professor Calloway. Uh, this is about commodity ecology, 130 categories for sustainable development. It's sort of framed as a required checklist and rubric toward achieving the abstract sustainable development goals. I mean, they have these goals, like achieve this, but there's no way, uh, they, they've sort of left it to nations to decide how to achieve that. And a lot of these goals are very abstract, like gender equality. Now I wonder who's gonna make the decision when they reach these successful rates of that? Is it gonna be even? Are they gonna accept 30%? Um, so my rubric is at least about materials, 130 materials uh, regarding Mark, that. Can I make a comment? Yes. Go. It's not abstract that the gender equality is not abstract. It's the measure. How are you going to measure it is abstract. And achieve okay. it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I mean, gender equality, everybody knows what it means. Point right? taken. Treating different. <clears throat> but they but didn't for, define how to measure it. For policy to get there, they leave it well, sort of open. Well, <clears throat> just don't say it's abstract. No, no. Really know it's what a goal. It is. A goal is abstract, but yeah. I agree with this abstract goal. I'm just saying I would like to have some way to clearly get to it, and this is what it's structured. Yeah, they don't have. Thank you. Um, but <laughs> the periodic table of a healthy element. This is also, you know, in my office. I said, move over Mendeleev. You know, he invented the periodic table in 1969. We still haven't added anything to it, despite the fact of all the things that we've learned in the past 150 years. Um, so a lot of inductive things you should add, I think, particularly about unintended, <coughs> indirect, and delayed effects of working with certain elements. Like where are the healthy elements, where are the non-healthy elements, and kind of a cognitive fix for chemists, okay. not just to see a box of tools, but to see a box of tools that are healthy and less healthy, and that may help future developments. <coughs> uh, in that way. So these are all very hybrid topics, that's my point. Um, so another hybrid topic, where's Anthony? Anthony wanted me to include this. But a uh, book draft on trialectics, it's really a, a character test. People come in my, my room, and if they don't say anything, that explains me their personality. If people are like very curious, that explains, you know, Jim is befuddled. I want to explain this to you as well uh, about this. This is a, kind of a universal history where Europe is just another case. It's a manuscript of about eight chapters so far. It's a book about different comparative patterns in world history no one has really talked about yet about geographical dynamics of power. And theoretically different from all the big six of sociology as well. But I just wanted to mention that come chat with me about that, that would take another hour. But the point is, uh, beyond these two books, here they are, I'm interested in a lot of mobile phones because I've really been inspired by a lot of the courses that I teach here at SUNY Korea. Um, particularly the ones I've been able to design have all been about mobile technologies. And I've always been fascinated by world history and the effect of our technologies on ourselves and our choices. But um, I've designed the mobile revolution and development, the undergraduate class, it's taught I think four times so far, the graduate class, mobile technologies and disaster risk reduction, 
twice so far. And a lot of, you know, particularly technology assessment, gets me aware of all these hybrid interactions. And so I've constantly been getting more and more data about good and bad aspects of mobile development. And this is sort of a, a collaboration with Dr. Brown because we both share a lot of uh, concern about humanitarian technology, uh, equitable developments, assuring healthy development. So our, our interests are similar in health, and that's motivated us to put together a survey. And as I said, you know, I'm interested how these inspire me to think about mobile ICT networks as either developmental strategies or disaster risk reduction, not just as technologies, but as human strategies uh, as well. Are the novel media regimes that deserve appreciation as beginning to create a radically different civilization that may upend even nation <coughs> states within 100 years? We, uh, there's, you, know, you saw that picture of Barcelona. When, when most regions are animated like that, what will happen to larger contexts of our previous state? that a lot of sociologists have argued are really based upon mass printing. And you know, once we move beyond mass printing and singular languages uh, of scripts, the, what happens to regionality? This is also Manuel Castells was very concerned 20 years ago by the third book of his uh, trilogy, Rise of the Network Society, of what will happen to us socially. Or Yokai Bankler's yes. Wealth of Network. Yes, yes. Which, um, or Jeremy Rifkin's mm -hmm. book, Mm -hmm. Plural. Yeah. So media, you know, we choose our media, but you know, media affects us a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with that background, obviously I tend to think about rather large issues over long periods of time. And I think about, you know, what is real and important are the hybrid topics. So here's introducing Matu. I had to dust this off, Susan. I had to go find the link. Um, or it's actually a QR code. We tried to make this a mobile survey that was capable of being organized on a mobile phone. And you can use, of course, any kind of computer to take a survey. Um, there's a consent form originally for it. It's called MATU, which is a new abbreviation for Mobile Addiction and Time Use Survey. And we're always looking for future collaborators and new zones of collaboration. Right now, we have at least two countries involved with this data analysis, and we invite people who are aligned with our research to join us, whether in analysis or finding a new location. Um, we make it better, stronger, faster. We were gonna make a better survey, right? We were not very satisfied. Uh, or at least there was a lot more things I wanted to add. And um, if you were walking by our office maybe two years ago, you would have heard loud screams from both of us as we're fighting over <laughs> what should be in and what should be not. <laughs> um, I look back at that with fond memories, actually. <laughs> Can I add, add to it? Yeah, I think yeah. only after we start analyzing the data, we realize that some questions are not, were not properly asked. Mm -hmm. and that's okay. why you Please. circle back and yeah. go and fix it. And I'll, I'll mention that one of the ideas that we're researching that I'm presenting today came about after the survey developed. So we're combing together to put together an index to measure these new things that we began to be interested in. Some things but uh, just the one slide about the history, about 2016, <laughs> Dr. Brown, who gives next week's le lecture on humanitarian technology, and she and I began to construct what became now known as the MATU because we had similar, yet many additional different questions we wanted to ask about mobile addiction. We didn't just want to copy that. There was a lot of other things that we wanted to address. Uh, some of them were about with particular platforms. And we get to even start that kind of research. Yeah. But um, I was mostly interested in, of course, sociologists, social demographics. What are the different demographic backgrounds and addiction? Uh, does it matter whether what kind of housing you live in? Or you live alone versus that? What's the strength or minimal relation? But we got interested in something that wasn't based on demographics in this research. So our, as I said, our common interest in technology and public health we were soon joined by another researcher at our home department of technology society at Stony Brook, as well as another researcher at St. Joseph's College in Long Island, very close to SBU, interested respectively in adding questions more about resilience and economic incentives of use. And in the summer of 2017, both Dr. Brown and I triangulated with these people. We went to SBU in New York for a full week. And during that week, we met in person, people we Skyped with, Dr. Deborah Dwyer, she's no longer with our department there. 
Uh, we also met Dr. Rachel Pryor of St. Joseph's College, and the fifth person was added, uh, Maria San Martin at Hofstra. So these three schools plus ours became the source of the data. It's kind of a convenient sample. Yes. Maria is a PhD student that graduated from that. Yeah, I know that, yeah. So they're all connected. And also Rachel Pryor is the, uh, an older woman who got a PhD late in life and is also uh, a previous uh, advisee from Deborah Dwyer. So this net, Deb's networks joined our team here. And the topic of you know our week's collaboration was the early data on mobile phone addictions. We originally analyzed three populations, but then there was New York's Hofstra University for a total of four universities. And we hoped to then, I remember, to get to Indonesia. I was really looking forward to finding Indonesian data, but we had, has not happened yet. And if you know how to help us, as I said, expand other countries, or if your personal interests or contacts align with ours in studying this, please, we'd love you to join our team. Um, we currently have 1,219 anonymized respondents in the data set. So it's rather large, um, but ongoing research and discussion is just about some aspects that we've already arranged for publication and sent off by late 2018. Um, this new survey was constructed from a review of other surveys, mostly Korean, because Korea really is ground zero for this research. Why Korea became saturated first. Uh, and I'll, have some sh I'll show you how saturated Korea is on many things in just a moment, too. Um, it's an online survey, which is perhaps too long. It's 120 questions. Um, but um, the composite Matu survey was validated as a pilot survey here. A lot of undergraduates remember that when we were moving around, giving chocolate to everybody, trying to get them, get them to uh, fill out the pilot. Um, the survey has many different sections frequency of activities, behaviors related to phone use, uh, how virtual is your own life, uh, reasons for personal use, views on withdrawal, how desperate are you when you forget your phone, you have to change your whole day schedule to retrieve it, um, questions on risky behavior, comorbidity is a big research issue in, in all addictions. Comorbidity means you're addicted to something else, maybe you're also addicted to mobile behaviors. <clears throat> Uh, co correlated addictions happen a lot in individuals. Um, feelings and opinions associated with mobile phones, whether you think mobile phones are a good idea or a bad idea uh, for social reasons. Concluding demographic section, that as a sociologist I add, probing personal, familial, sociological characteristics, religious adherences, and things like that interest people. But anyway, uh, for this study, all the sections were used except the demographic. And this is the abstract, sort of a shorter version that you have in front of you. This research explores whether addictions around mobile phones should be treated as a physiological, that's like an external physical thing, that you get addicted to a thing, or is it a personal, internal, psychological problem? Which is more important? A lot of the literature, as just like you probably hear, <coughs> they, they only want to talk about one at a time. They don't want to think about degrees of both. And our survey is really about, or this question is really about degrees of both. Um, respectively, policy and treatments greatly hinge on whether people assume this external physiological etiology or internal etiology. Etiology is a medical term for the origin of disease. So the origin of this is kind of a narrative. What do you blame for it? Do you blame the phone for your addiction, or do you blame your personal hopelessness for your addiction? That's Why do you call Physiological, external, external to what? It, well, the phone is physically external. If you did not have the phone, a but lot of people are addiction. Aren't. You're talking about right, right. Yeah. But if there's a neurological connection with external things, but without the external thing, you wouldn't be addicted. That's what a physiological argument is. Uh, a lot of people think you know sugar is a physiological addiction. A lot of people think mobile phone is a physiological addiction, and it justifies a policy. And most policies around the world, Korea included in China, they think that the mobile phone is a physiological addiction. Therefore, the policy is you isolate yourself from the physical thing. And they haven't been very successful in actually removing addiction from people with that. Actually, some children have died um, because they're treated to the boot camp environments, like the military, and uh, they are simply pushed into that. 
we'll talk about that later. But as the whole world moves to this smartphone saturated youth culture, lessons drawn from patterns of these behavioral problems are important to consider. Um, this is United States data. Let's just show how fast this has happened. And that's why it's so surprising that there's not much more research about this yet. But this is uh, within six or seven years, the smartphone has been over 70% of the US population. Look how long it took the telephone to get only about 30 or 40%. But once this network value developed, right, then the internet was based on the telephone. The internet could come much faster and the mobile phone after that. So once you know some technological society has built this network, these are sort of the children of this slowly developing network of telephony around the world. And the smartphone being the hub of all these different technologies is really fast. Um, another world's first we might not be aware of. It's not a minor thing when half of the world's web traffic goes to a mobile phone now, from 2017 or more now. Look how fast this changed, from 0.7 to 50% in less than a decade. So it's a radical rewiring of people's socialization, their participation in things, uh, Cell phone access around the world is skyrocketed. This is World Bank data. Here's the world average. And above it are places like East Asia, Arab world, Latin America, Caribbean, Australia, Thailand, Qatar, Russian Federation right here. This is 2015 data. So even by 2015, you have basically 160 per 100 mobile phone connections per people in the Russian Federation, despite it not having a great deal of bandwidth uh, and location. So you find, ironically, the countries above the world average tend to be poorer, and that's what fascinates me as a developmental model, that mobile phones are really quite developmental because there are really, a, so many services get heaped on mobile ICT networks uh, because they're more stable. Yes? Uh, so there is a theory why the undeveloped countries do it because they do leapfrogging. They, yeah. they don't do, um, fixed lines, right. so yeah. mm -hmm. they they don't have the legacy networks to begin well, with. I mean, so. This, I mean, so they don't need to repeat this legacy yeah. idea, yeah. So they, they can benefit they instantly from all the things that have been done. Skip that step. Yeah. Right. They go directly into there, so. And particularly, Sub-Saharan Africa right now is very interesting mm -hmm. on maker movements and 3D printing. They're gonna skip a lot of things that were mass industrial, and it will just go right to a decentralized production system. But anyway, um, okay. some global statistics here that you may not be aware of. First, from 2017, just to show how fast this changed, to 2019, this is from a place uh, called Food Suites. And if you wanna read all of the methods for how they did this, it's all based on big data analysis uh, of firms. Uh, it's, we Are Social is the name of the website, but you know, from 2017, there's 7.5 billion people, and there's already 66% of the world population with a mobile phone. Almost, almost 5 billion by then. By 2019, it is over 5 billion. It's 5.1 billion mobile phones. Notice uh, almost, this is mobile social media users. So social media is almost half the world's population. That's changing the dynamics of media and control and narrative domination globally. Notice how from 2017, they moved this up as the most important thing. They used to kind of think, I assume that the internet was the most important phenomenon, but they put that at the third level. This has jumped ahead as the most important metric that's higher than the others. Um, what about just in Africa? You might think, well, Africa is undeveloped, right? 1.3 billion people as of 2017, over 1 billion mobile phones. Lower social media though. By 2019, uh, it's actually you know, 1.3. 04, it's gone up a bit, just 80%, from 82 to 80, but the population has grown, I assume, and that's why you have a, a slight difference. But what about another less developed place? What about India? India with 1.4 billion, 87% uh, of their population has a mobile phone. There's a book that I, I use in the mobile class called The World's Biggest Phone Book. It's about you know, Indian mobile development. It's <laughs> and, um, it's about the same level as Africa, really, in social media. But this is not a joke by any state. This is the world as it stands. This is a Facebook map. Uh, it says Facebook, I think, for 2015. Of the places at the time with 4G, 3G, and 2G, look at India. Who would have guessed? I mean, 
look at Korea. Kind of <laughs> Korea is the Emerald City, right? It's like the Wizard of Oz place where it's a totally dense network. Even Japan is sort of spotty when you get to Hokkaido. Uh, and even, you know, massive powerhouses of ICT here are mostly 3G or 4G in spotty ways in Scandinavia. Even the United States has a big hole right in the middle around Appalachia. Um, here is Kenya, here is Nigeria. Those are the big powerhouses of ICT in Africa, and you can see them showing up on this map. And those, you wouldn't have guessed that. I think it's Thailand. I mean, I, I encourage my students, nobody's ever chosen Thailand to do their group paper report in the undergraduate class, but something very interesting has happened in Thailand for us to be that dense in that area, as well as Vietnam. Um, so that's just, that's our world as it stands for mobile networks. Notice Russia, very spotty. But as you saw, there's a huge number of mobile phones <laughs> in Russia. But anyway, so eight first about Korea. Why are we searching in Korea? Korea is some of the highest internet access per capita. I'll just go over the eight points. Equally dense is the Korean youth smartphone culture. By 2013, South Korea became the world's first smartphone saturated youth culture with 97.7 ownership of smartphone, not mobile phone, but smartphone, for 18 to 24. The same year in the United States, barely 50. Now they're more even. Number two, two years later, 2015, all working adults, young adults, through grades 35, virtually everyone in Korea had that phone uh, by 2015. Another world's first in saturation. Pew is Pew surveys in the United States. Um, by two more years, by 2017, another world first saturation plateau reached when nearly 100% of households in South Korea had internet access. Another world's first, breaking its own record of 94 two years earlier. Dr. Modell always says, not my in-laws, they don't have it. So, so everybody except Dr. Modell's in-laws have internet in their house. Jim, you wanted to say something? No. Okay. 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 Um, South Korea has the world's fastest internet bandwidth for 10 years running up through 2017 from Akamai's data. Akamai has put this behind a paywall now. It used to have a free service. I missed their uh, online graph service, but that's gone. But I've got some graphs from that which demonstrate through 2017 that Korea has maintained number one status except for like one quarter or two where they, it's not sure what happened, but nonetheless, for the past 10 years or more. Korea is much faster. Uh, also, it's the cheapest bandwidth cost in the OECD. I looked at some OECD data. This is uh, for 100 uh, megabytes per second subscription costs. Korea is <laughs> pennies compared to the rest of the world for that. Um, six, South Korea will have the first 5G, maybe in early 2015, being deployed around Songdo from November of last year here. I think it's these new artificial trees that you see all over our campus. By, by the way, Mark, yeah. on the speed, yeah. I, I did a blog post on this. There's a brand new open signal report okay. that uh, reinforces that Korea is way ahead of even Singapore and these other Asian countries. Go ahead. What is the new rate? Um, the open signal report you know, is based on uh, subscriptions to open signal. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Um, I forget exactly in megabits per second. I think 47 average megabits wow, really? per second. Wow. But what they do in this report is uh, a global analysis of um, download speed by time of day because that relates to congestion on the network. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, by anyway, it's an interesting analysis. But I just, you just, like, like what Jim had said, that a lot of the other competitors of South Korean speed, they're city-states. Um, I skipped over this for interest of time, but only two other countries with equal numbers of smartphones per capita, like South Korea, they're UAE and Singapore. But South Korea is a large country of 51 million people now, but with a small land. So the only other really truly smartphone-saturated societies are city-states. This is the only nation-state, I would say, with any kind of saturation of smartphones. So it's not surprising that the first few smartphone surveys sponsored by the Korean government, by the way, uh, to figure out what's happening with youth and new forms of addiction here, particularly. Um, 
Um, South Korea will also have the first nationwide dedicated emergency services LTE network. It's been postponed, I believe. Uh, yeah. It was going to be like 2018, but at least it's being built. Um, other countries like the United States have been trying to build theirs since after 2001, but they haven't even put up the power or decided on a technology. But Korea will have uh, dedicated emergency services, so nothing will be clogged in the an emergency for uh, communicating even out to the oceans around Korea. Um, number eight, which is one makes on dissertation or in our department, only state ever mandating nationwide digital authentication. They've kind of failed. Korea is currently the number two hacked country in the world. First one is the United States. Um, in terms of gross records, only China and India have more gross hacked records than South Korea. And South Korea is 120th the population of those countries. So there's a huge amount of digital theft happening in Korea. Uh, but they tried to make it the world most secure, ended up locking in the technology. So Korea moves fast, right? And that's why this is so interesting. The fact of the Matu, given this survey is micro-level analysis of human behavior, it's a comparative micro-level individual analysis, so we attempt to minimize these structures of countries. And how do you minimize that? Methodologically, you have to pick other countries that look similar to Korea. And now, the United States at least is over about 94 saturation for smartphones as well. And so we match a lot of infrastructural and speed issues. And the United States is the best place to compare to only look at exclusive things like uh, individual addiction patterns. So they have kind of the same economic status bandwidth. So the methods of comparison and choosing these locations help to justify the argument that other factors are effectively blocked for better concentration on what I will talk about today. Um, defining addiction. It's a very old definition before mobile phones. It's behavior that can provide relief from internal discomforts and is employed in a pattern characterized by recurrent failure to control behavior. Um, as digital information technology began to permeate people's lives, in the 1980s, this new term, technological addiction, was coined by Goodman. But you know, later, by 2004, internet addiction, not just technological addiction. Different types of users associated with an uncontrollable urge, a loss of control, preoccupation with use, continued use despite any personal or social problems. And nonetheless, you may be surprised, there is no official definition for mobile addiction or internet addiction. Um, what we have is just different compete competitions for where to classify this new phenomenon. The, uh, the DSM, which is the American Psychological Association's last publication of all the phobias and things that they make, um, that doesn't have that. They only have two non-chemical addictions, gambling, and they've already integrated internet gaming disorder, which is similar to gambling, right? So gambling is seen as really the only other structure right now uh, beyond mobile technology. And so however, the fact that discussion has begun about whether to add this category for mobile addiction and how to define it, whether it's just a fresh branch of existing impulse control. So a lot of people think it's just impulse control. And so we're sort of testing that with one of our categories. Is, is mobile addiction more of an impulse control structure? Or is it more behavioral disorder? Is it anxiety? Is it hopelessness, depression? Um, things like that. Or is it a separate, unique category of just attachment to the internet itself? Provides evidence that smartphones have begun to be considered a locus of fresh technological additions, uh, addictions. However, people play, as I said, fast and loose with this term mobile addiction. And just what, and just extend the use of the term as if it's already clear what it is, when it's unclear what it is. Nobody knows really what it is. And so, this paper is trying to make a contribution to the debate on defining mobile addiction. We want to show some very unique patterns. Uh, unlike all past singular covering models, it's kind of a philosophical, philosophy of science uh, structure. A covering law is something which you know explains everything in one variable or two. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little behind, but um, when you said that there is no, there is um, in 2009, 2000, the young lady, yeah. young. She developed an index for internet addiction. So mobile addiction is piggybacking on it. Yes, they're using that to, so there is a, they used her index. 
and but they had to add more categories. Yeah, I, I so agree, that's, but I, that's basic. about the global addiction survey, but in terms of psychologists actually identifying the oh, disorder, yeah, nobody's okay. clear what the disorder is. That's, but that's, I mean, that's how they're testing for it. Right, right. So their thinking is just an extension of it. Vari right, uh, sorry, variation. Yeah, that's what this group, you passed me this paper, thank you. This was really mm -hmm. a good review of just how quick and fast and loose people are. They just start saying, well, this isn't like that. We're going to apply it as an impulse control. They don't really ask the question, is it really an impulse control disorder? It's surprising nobody's really done this research of simultaneously comparing the weights of different kinds of theories about mobile addiction in one data set. They just start with one model, like you said. They assume it's impulse control and see how close it is to that. And they don't try to do two things at once and see if they interact in any way. But, um, so we're gonna show something a little bit different than physiological drug addiction. A lot of people, like, that's the external thing we're talking about. The, if, the, if the phone is an external addiction, if the phone is an external addiction, the policy tends to be remove yourself from the phone and you get better. A lot of people don't get better when they get removed from the phone. So for some people, the phone is their lifeline. And um, there's actually some data indicating people's connections to the phone make them feel better than they would if they were totally isolated. So it really depends on the person uh, like that. Also, we're gonna show something different than impulse control disorder because we're gonna show some data where uh, impulse control is sort of autonomous to even sensation seeking. Uh, it doesn't even connect to sensation seeking on a phone. It's a sort of impulse control problem itself. But we'll also show something different than a psychological behavioral addiction. Uh, so there's a bit of a hybrid thing going on here in mobile addiction itself, and we're sort of arguing for a new definition, and you know, as I was told in graduate school, the best way to get somebody talking about what you're doing is start a controversy, and then everybody yells at you, and then that's the way you become friends or enemies with people. And, but you get talked about. But if you talked about, then, then not to be talked about at all. But anyway, as I said, it's common to project onto this internet addiction and mobile addiction lessons learned from studies of drug addiction without testing or adjudicating if the assumption of parallelism is warranted. Now, what has been less common is actually testing if such projections are justified. Hypothesis, is it like a physiological addiction? Hypothesis, is it like this? Is it like this? Yeah. And by comparing different ideas in the same study, in addition, it's been less common to test whether one imported model has more power than another instead of binary yes or no. Uh, therefore, the study addresses both these methods by comparing physiological, uh, psychological, excuse me, and physiological theories of addiction, both developed around drug addiction, and whether they apply to behavioral addictions around mobile phones and to what extent they do. Uh, so, what are the different ways addiction's been researched? So the academic literature really begins in the 1930s. Um, four main etiological claims, etiological, as I said, origins of disease, about the cause and therefore the solution of addiction. If you have a cause, you're really making the argument that that's the important thing that's going to cause a solution as well. So and these are all could be applied to thinking about mobile addictions as well. These four claims are like competing narratives. Uh, one, access. People get addicted to what's cheap. Cheaper alcohol versus expensive drugs. Um, there's a famous discussion on the rise of Applejack, which is a very free alcohol that you can get from freezing hard apple cider, and why Americans planted apple trees all across the United States in the 1800s. It's free alcohol. And so people got really drunk. There's a good book about America called The Alcoholic Republic, talking about a huge amount of alcohol Americans were just doing for themselves all over the country throughout the 1800s. It was accessible. Um, a lot of people talked about this for many addictions. <coughs> sociological, some of the first work of sociological analysis, it's not about a physical addiction. It's more like, what is the mental relationship that somebody has with their drug? It's all about anticipations. Um, particularly Lynn Smith interviewed junkies, uh, uh, heroin addicts in the 1930s and found that they weren't really addicted to heroin per se. They were addicted to, every time they got worried, they, which is what they assumed they would get from heroin, would lead them to take it. But he would notice that even they agreed that they didn't feel better after heroin. It was kind of their assumptions of their connections that would make them feel better at one point led them into the addiction. And, it didn't, and they kind of admitted they didn't make them feel better, but they kept doing it. So the repetition was a behavioral repetition 
leading to a physical reinforcement. And they, and they interpreted it, it was the physical thing that they're addicted to. So there's two levels. It's like interpretations become very important in addictions after Linsman. Um, these were kind of tested again in 1974. Other things I don't want to uh, talk about for lack of time. But physiological, that's one of the two micro level things we're talking about. Physiological or genetic. Kadaris uh, has a book called Glow Kids. He's a medical doctor interested in the claims that mobile phones are like dopamine and that they create dopamine reactions in the body. And so therefore he Can assumes that's- Can you explain that's dopamine? Huh? Explain dopamine. I will, I'm gonna to come to this in a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's three of them. One, one's a dopamine okay. pathway. But, um, but that's a physiological theory, that it is primary above the other theories. And of course, a psychological theory. That, you know, what about people who go to hospitals? If you get morphine in the hospital, are you a lifetime addict of morphine? Probably not. So I mean, he says, in a lot of people study addictions and how people get addicted. Dick Clemente is an interesting guy. He studies how people break addictions. Um, and notices that physiological connections are very weak causally for how people get into, or that it's a very psychological view of how people achieve addictions. But Conrad is in this view, and we are applying work of Conrad in our uh, discussion. So, Despite arguments that most, I said addictions, I always do that, it says addictions, sorry. Addictions are known to be interscientific phenomena involving biological, physical, social interactions. Policymakers regularly say, you know, the phone is like heroin, or, you know, we have a crisis of child addicts that need to be broken and get better discipline, so that they use these analogies without really being clear and there really is very little data justifying one etiology over the other quite yet. Um, so since this study focuses on the micro level, our data uh, testing differences in individual level physiological or psychological issues. We can't really address infrastructural issues because we match them. We can't really address social cultural upbringing because we're trying to keep the same developed country environment. We think they're important. It's just this particular structure is not we're not denying their importance, uh, it's just that they're not in this data. Anyway, um, it was the intent, as I said, to sample equal zones for meso macro variables in order to match a block against those infrastructural macro things. So all of these things sort of match South Korea and the United States. Uh, and therefore, with that sample selection, we could focus more legitimately on these two remaining micro level theories. And Conrad fell in our laps. I mean, Conrad is sort of an example of the you know, there's always like a genie. There's, that's what my graduate advice is. There's like a genie that will come to you when you least expect it and change your perspective or give you a really good hypothesis to test. And Conrad is my genie. It's for Dr. Patricia Conrad, uh, University of Montreal. And she, for 25 years, has been studying drug addictions. And she made a very good model of drug addictions and has tested this as a diagnostic tool. It's a tool that actually is successful in breaking people from their addiction. So we're very interested in that because, oh, here's something not only a model, but it's tested as it works in a lot of uh, high school youth, basically. And it, this combination of physiological and psychological factors make addiction in Conrad's view. Adjudicated theory? Adjudicated theory. Ad what is meant by adjudicated? I usually associate that with the courts of law. Well, yeah, really? is, it, is it innocent or guilty? But theories by social scientists. I'm, I'm sorry, I've already used adjudicated. When you make a judgment whether one is valid or the not, you judge a theory. That's just what it means. By who? By me, yeah, by the data. Oh. Yeah, yeah, by, <laughs> yeah. How these, well, her theories are adjudicated over a very long period of time, of about 25 years of research, she's been polishing this. So she, I would say, in this case, has adjudicated her model very well. Um, across 25 years. So, so the definition is a formal judgment or decision about the problem or disputed matter. Yeah. So she has sort of tried to resolve a dispute about what are the origins of drug addiction and come to the conclusion there's about 15 different categories that Weinstein has reviewed. She's narrowed it to four and said they're all kind of bundled into four major categories that explain drug addiction. Um, 
So the physiological blame, let's talk about that. Of addiction are popular since the arguments are the simple. Physiological argument, only external issues are sources of behavioral addictions. In this case, the hypothesis would argue external mobile phones directly or physically or neurologically you know, are like drugs that cause people to become addicted uncontrollably. This is the stress that is an external factor that takes over your body. Policy, if that were true, then policies for removing or limiting time use on mobile phones is presumed, not proven, but presumed to create the physical withdrawal which could begin to cure mobile addiction. That, in China or Korea, has not been very successful policy. That's typically what they do. They try to cut off all the internets and all the phones and try to cure them, and then they go back to their old ways. It's like, it's not really, that's not exclusively a good etiological model. Um, the idea of this external cause is framed as a neuroscientific one because of an ongoing feedback loop between the external causes and either an addict's individually unique neurological susceptibilities or all humans. We're not dealing with genetics in this study, of course. But that's one of the arguments, that humans may be genetically addicted to certain things. Psychological, psychological, uh, excuse me, physiological, I can't read Physiological, three neurological causal feedback mechanisms have been identified in their chemical particulars from research on past drug addictions. And many of the same addictive pathways are argued to exist around external mobile phones. Uh, some authors uh, argue that since mobile phones impinge upon the same neuroscientific pathways already known in drug addictions, these phones are just like drugs, right? Kadaris explains several different neurological mechanisms. One is a dopamine pathway. Screen time exposure has similar developmental effects on the brain as drugs. So they do brain scans and they compare drug addictions to uh, screen time and there's dopamine reactions similarly. Yeah. I wanted to say for, for people who don't know what's dopamine, it's a neural transmitter. Yeah. It's, a, it's a chemical substance that helps your neurons transmit um, your brain work. Okay. So I don't know if that's a common And the second pathway is not a is less a biochemical pathway, more how behavioral repetition can cause neurodevelopmental structural. It's like ongoing reaction make a pathway that makes it easier for that behavior to be addictive. So it's the social things creating a physical change, but it needs that external factor to kick it into action. A third pathway is adrenaline. Adrenaline, you know, the rush of gaming or fear. People get addicted to fear. They get addicted to movies, uh, like the horror movies, or they want that rush again that they experience, the hype, the fear of awareness. Um, um, uh, one more thing. Yeah, Adrenaline yeah. is more commonly known, but it's really the chemical that produces in humans when they have to fight or flight. Yeah. So when they're under stress or attacked or, life, or, yeah, yeah. or any kind of life in that situation. So there's, there's three neurological connections. So there's some data that, you know, there's potential pathways already in humans that mobile phones might latch onto. Um, psychological, different than physiological theories are psychological theories of addiction. That your personal mental behavioral characteristics are prerequisite. Those are the first causes. They explain addictions in general. This is argued for even physiological drug addictions, like in Lindsay. Like, they, junkies were really anticipating the good relationships with their drug that they never really got. And they kept anticipating and wanting it to be true. Um, but it wasn't as good as they always hoped it would be. So anyway, there have been various pre-existing internal psychological anticipations for such an external physiological addiction to take root and be maintained. You have to have this constant desire and anticipation Particularly for Conrad, this view of addiction is characterized as an additive phenomenon. And that's what we're interested in, because if you have one model that's fixed and sort of proven over time, and if the model has psychological and physiological factors, then you can use that model and apply it to mobile addiction. And we thought nobody's done that before, so that's one of the things we're doing. Um, so together, you know, those are this etiological debate between two very different causes, whether mobile phones are physiological addictions in themselves, causing psychological problems, like Kadaris argues, or whether people have mere psychological addictions to mobile phones. And only as a secondary consequence, they generate this ongoing physiological reinforcement. 
third hybrid idea is this additive theory of Kanban, that you need both. You don't really have an addiction without both some kind of level of uh, physiological and psychological problems. A uh, combination of proneness to sensation seeking, that's her term, which is a physiological issue. It's, you, you, have, you enjoy the sensation of the phone. That's a kind of behavioral characteristic, but it's external at the same time. And various psychological problems. And she's isolated those to impulsiveness, anxiety, and hopelessness. And we call this SIAH. That helps you remember it. Sensation seeking, impulsiveness, anxiety, hopelessness, S-I-A-H. Um, another fourth possibility is there is not one model. Like all of these are wrong. Meaning, you know, they have an etiology in one or the other in different individuals. There is no covering law. Like it may be that some people are physiologically addicted while, you know, other people's relationship with the phone is more psychological. And other people do have this hybrid structure like Conrad talks about. That's a possibility nobody's really talked about either. So the problem of language encourages us to admit these abstract terms, so you know, it's not really justified. Nobody's really quite proven what this is yet. And there's our protagonist, Dr. Conrad. Hmm. French, she's Canadian, so there's a good symbolic pediatric, social, social and community pediatrics, children's health. So. Um, backed by extensive research and much confirmation that her model is useful in pre-identifying proneness to drug addictions, has a multi-causal theory of these four factors, sensation seeking, impulsiveness, anxiety, and hopelessness. She isolated these four mixed behavioral and psychological factors that predict proneness to physiological drug addiction in the high school youth. It's quite a contribution because it narrowed a huge survey of what is drug addiction. Um, in Weinstein and LeJoyo, 2010, they argue those four things are in their review of the whole literature, but they have so many other things that people have associated this with. She's kind of narrow, tried to narrow it down to a few things that predicts more strongly than the other things. I think, I think she's eliminated the other things, in other words, as, as less important than these four things. Anyway. The first of her behavioral factors is a hybrid physiological, psychological factor, sensation seeking. Other three are more pure psychological, impulsiveness, anxiety, hopelessness. And we define these as this way. Uh, sensation seeking, someone prone to enjoy external stimuli. People, this is Conrad's research, people scoring high on her sensation seeking index have been linked to a preference for particular kinds of drugs. If you're a sensation seeker, there's no abstract drug. You like amphetamine. But if you score high on like anxiety, you don't like amphetamine. You want depressants. You want morphine. You want heroin. So the point is, she's really helped predict which kind of drugs that which particular individual susceptibilities are connected to. And a parallel to this would be which particular personal susceptibilities do people's personalities have on the mobile phone? Do you like social media? Do you like gaming? Do you prefer relaxation apps? Uh, yeah. Is it the other way around for her diagnostics that she finds people who like amphetamines and then goes backwards and proves that that is the kind they have? Because you would, when you meet a person, you know what they're addicted to, right? It's external yeah. um, uh, factor right. you can measure, and then you go back and find out that that's what there right. is, right? right? Yeah, you don't start with a theory and then come up with what they like. No, it's the, the is, other direction. The correct. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. So hopelessness, all of these are defined. Depression, fatalism, feels trapped. Their interpretation, they're without future options. So that's generally the accepted definition of that. <laughs> So Conrad's found those four personality traits that interested us. Could the same model work for helping to find who was more prone to mobile addiction? Uh, we had to test it first because it's a drug model, and all the questions are about drugs. And so we luckily have asked a lot of questions in our Matthew survey that would be cobbled together into these indexes that were similar to her, her way she asked her questions about those four factors. But um, no, that required changing a lot of indices of how what was a drug use or behavior around a drug was instead now measured by mobile phone use or other behaviors around mobile phones. Our six indices are explained in just a minute. But Conrad's theory, why is it a hybrid and additive? Because she finds that sensation seeking, 
this physiological issue is not predictive of Crohn's disease. So she really comes down harder on the idea that drug addiction is a psychological addiction because people that score only high on S, they're not gonna get addicted. It's people who are a combined model. It has to be paired increasingly with the other three psychological problems for people to develop a behavioral drug addiction associated with their ongoing impulsive problems. So if you score high on I, A, and H, you're more likely to fall into a drug addiction. But if you score only high on sensation seeking, you're not really a deeply addicted person. Anyway, uh, thus Comrade argues for a model of drug addictions in which four factors interact, in which those with only a proneness to sensation seeking are less likely to develop addictions. Um, in this analysis, Conrad's four factor model is tested whether the same pattern holds for mobile addictions, extends this personality targeted analysis to mobile phone addictions. The same rubric for the first time. Our antagonist, Dr. Kadaris, <laughs> digital heroin. Uh, it's like the head of the FBI in the 1930s, if you know, just murderous, crazy marijuana, um, driving people insane. Um, Dr. Nicholas Kadaris, author of Glow Kids, how screen addiction is hijacking, all these they're very emotionally hot words, right? our kids and how to break the trance. You know, it's an external model here it's for him. He's mostly all about the dopamine pathway. He thinks dopamine is the issue. But anyway, uh, um, so we're gonna analyze both physiological as well as, yeah, physiological as well as psychological aspects. Yeah. If Kadaris was true, then we would expect all those reporting greater mobile phone time use to only score high on sensation seeking. So if Kadaris is true, S will be a high scoring group and IAH will be not important. That's what we can test. Policy that would legitimate you know, external treatment, isolation of mobile phones. On the other hand, if Conrad's ideas of drug addiction are applicable to mobile addiction, uh, then we would expect IAH, impulsiveness, anxiety, hopelessness to be more associated with mobile time use and sensation seeking would not be that important. So they're inverted. We expect, there's two inversions we expect to see if Conrad's right. Uh, if Conrad's ideas are right, universal solutions to mobile addiction, like Kadaris argues, are mistaken. And instead, more individually tailored diagnostics for identifying different individuals' internal susceptibilities to mobile addiction would be more helpful. In short, if Conrad's model were true, for mobile addiction we would expect those with only mobile phone time correlations or only predictions of sensation seeking have very few problems. You know, they wouldn't really score high on anything except sensation seeking and they wouldn't be really addicted. Uh, but for Kadaris, we would expect to score high on everything at the same time. The, the physical connections would be associated with impulsiveness, anxiety, and hopelessness. So policy, that would legitimate individual treatment of Conrad with them. Moving on. So, Conrad or Kadaris, or will someone else win, like you know, Doctors Brown and I, you know. So, but um, is mobile addiction a unique addiction? This is what's been said before. As we move to this smartphone saturated youth culture, it's important to consider what we're doing and how to fix it. Um, behavioral patterns are found distinct from patterns of drug addiction. I'm summarizing it and then I'll go to the data now. We don't follow any of these models. Um, students who think they interpret that they have a mobile phone problem. That's what they tell us in the survey. Like, I have a mobile phone problem and it causes me a lot of anxiety. I, my huge time use damages my schooling. You know, They interpret that the phone is doing it to them. They, they don't have high sensation seeking. You know, they, they all interpret they do, but they don't. They have a very low, this is P0.1, they have very low sensation seeking. Um, yet, all of them have high correlation with three psychological problems in this order, from the highest to the lowest. They're impulsive, they're hopeless, and they're full of anxiety. But they're not sensation seekers. On the other hand, the exact inverse occurs among actual sensation seekers with high time use. We have a measure of index of time use. And if you go backwards and look at the index of time use, is it coordinated poorly with SIAH? High time use does not make people impulsive. It is not associated with anxiety. It's only associated with 
you know, high time use and sensation seeking. And it has no connection to psychological problems. So, you know, what's the issue here? Mobile addictions, we're arguing, should not be treated as drugs. They appear to be two very different types of individualized problems. Um, psychological problems for some, but they have no high time use. It's an interpretation they do have a problem with the phone, but they tell us in the same survey, they don't spend time on the phone com really high compared to other people. Um, it's also, it's a physiological problem for others, but they don't report any problems at all. They have no anxiety, they're happy, they're more well-adjusted. There's another index, the resilience index. They score highest on resilience. I mean, their high time use are more resilient across all, all these groups. So um, this research, we help the food policy to target individual problems instead of assuming everyone is the same mobile addiction. And this pattern actually held across four different universities in two countries with minimal variations. Um, so I just wanna show the data. The data is on the back of your sheet if you wanna look at that one chart that has everything. But the survey you know, looked at these four things. The sensation seeking became our physiological character. Impulsiveness, anxiety, and hopelessness, those were our psychological factors, and abbreviated SIAH. Um, I will skip that section. But the point is, the full sample that we got, we had sort of a problem, we thought. We had very different response rates, and we thought that would bias the index construction, and therefore, you know, one school might screw up the entire idea. So we had to justify, first, that the, this, the different schools had exactly the same scores on these indexes. Um, we also had, you know, two things that are regularly studied in mobile addiction are school outcomes. So we had lots of validated data about how you measure school outcomes connected to mobile phones, and we did that, and time use. But we added these four drug research categories, mobile addiction, sensation seeking now connected to mobile phones. All of these, you know, they previously the drugs, the drugs, the drugs, the drugs. But, you know, index one, school outcomes, all the ones, mobile, mobile, mobile. So these are questions directly from our survey that we cobbled together to make the index. I'm not gonna talk about these, I just wanna show you that we finalized them in this form. Time use of mobile phones was measured in this way. This is on a Likert scale from uh, one through seven, actually, from rarely to constantly. Um, and it was, of course, piloted, so nobody had confusion about these over time. Sensation seeking, this is the first of Conrad's idea, but now connected to mobile phones. Most of, all of these were correlated together. Impulsiveness connected to mobile phones. These, surprisingly, these four was the best numbers we got for Cronbach's Alpha, so we kept four. That seems to be all connected to each other and a good measure of impulsiveness. Um, anxiety, I can't imagine life without it. You know, painful, <coughs> anxious, panic, and impossible for me to give up. All that's were correlated with anxiety. And hopelessness, there's a lot of questions that we had about hopelessness on our survey. And this was, after a long time, figured out as the best model for Crumpack Alpha. But Crumpack Alpha, of course, well-established measure, used for assessed reliability and consistency of any measurement. Uh, similarly, exploratory factor analysis is a way to assure there is a single loading of the concept. Because we're playing with concepts. We want to justify our concepts first. We're not just assuming that we these questions really focus on something. We have to prove it that they do. And these are two statistical tools to prove that these indexes are valid. And uh, for the full sample, we showed this already, but uh, our, for the full sample, using the aggregate core sample, we have pretty good Cronbach alpha. 0.7 is sort of seen as the best, and anything above that is either better. So a lot of ours go over eight, or very near eight for all of our indexes. So we're I was quite pleased that we finally achieved that. We had a problem for a while, but we made the indexes different. Um, but the point is, you know, all of these are concepts. It's very hard to justify concepts. So what we did with all this, I won't bore you with it, but we did six different kinds of tests to make sure the concepts are valid. Whether, you know, Kaiser made him old can measure of sampling adequacy, but all of this gets very arcane uh, to make sure even the data itself is justifiably useful to even run those Cronbach's alpha tests. You can't, you can't really legitimately run a Cronbach's alpha test until you test it for this, and most people don't even do that. But, um, but all of that 
is been found. So do response rates of particular schools skew the index construction? No, thankfully. There were two problems. One was the respondent rates were different, as you saw. Demographics of one school might skew the creation of both the indices and the results. And so we ended up with false information. Therefore, before the main analysis, it was important to validate the lack of skew. And just to summarize the lack of skew, if you go down uh, across all of these indexes, each of these are tests of Chromevax Alpha, which took a long time. Um, so nonetheless, subsamples across all schools don't really have much difference, uh, as you can see, reading left to right, except for one. This is a sensation seeking in school A, which is here, was the only one. But anything above 0.5 is still questionable, they say. They don't call it doubtful. They, just, they said doubtful is more below 0.5, but it's not doubtful if it's useful. It's just questionable. But nonetheless, if all of our school A is very high on other things, we're going to have to accept that. Um, anyway, uh, going on, the results, we also have this. So for the full sample, we compared all sensation seeking, those indexes, to interpretations. So this is, you know, someone's, in Oh, we gotta plug my battery in. So this is interpretations of someone. And on the other side, we ask them, what is your real reported view? So we have two views. We have one is their psychological view of their problem, and at the same time, the record of what they tell us about their actual time use. And so we can compare to see if they are really aware of what they're doing or not. Pardon me while I close. So, what do you see here? Um, ironically, sensation seeking and real time use is correlated very highly. So that's kind of good for our view. But if you notice, sensation seeking is not associated, or real time use is not associated with any psychological problems. Very bloody low. And look at those p-values. That's, that's pretty, pretty different. But look at the opposite. This is very low for people's interpretations. They interpret that they have a problem uh, is very low, but really the highest things are their psychological factors. So interpretations are very tied to that, while you know sensation seeking alone is connected to that. So we also thought analysis might be connected to different schools. You know, we did 32 additional correlation tests on this. And what we have here is the full sample. That's what I showed you a moment ago. But these are all the four different schools running the exact same tests. You might argue, well, maybe one school's results is different. But if you notice, it's 0.844 here for the full sample of sensation seeking to actual reported use. It correlates with that. It's pretty similar in school A here, Sinecrea. It's pretty similar in school B, which is SBU. It's pretty similar in another private school in New York and Hofstra. So across four separate populations, this we find these sense. same relations. And it's very low here on all these things. It's so low, it has no relationship. So we, I interpreted that as stronger. Why do I interpret no statistical significance as a strong relationship? Because we're trying to show that impulsiveness, anxiety, and hopelessness, they have no real connection to your time use. It's you. It's not your phone. And so actually a negative or a lack of relationship really connects with the very low correlations of the other places. But it's always very low sensation seeking uh, for people's interpretations mm -hmm. while high frameworks everywhere else. Um, three interactive hypotheses, you know, is a universal physiological model or more individual psychological model important? Which is more correlated with school problems? The second question asks, do the same four behavioral factors you know, apply to predicting proneness? Third, if they do apply, is it the same additive pattern? And we've seen, no, it's not the same additive pattern. Um, I will, just for the sake of time, skip to my seven, yeah, conclu seven I, conclusions. Dr. Yes. Yeah. I, I gotta go soon. But no problem, Joe. I just have one question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're assuming that the mobile phone apparatus yes. is one single apparatus with an assumed set of technological platforms within that apparatus. Yes. And so let's say if there was a mobile phone without all those 
platforms, and it was just a regular traditional phone, but in fact was mobile. And I don't, that may be out of the scope of your research, yeah. but I'd be interested to know whether or not a plain phone only, without that content, would have the same type of psychological That effect. would be a very good test of the well, fact that it's a internet connection. I to do now because I know, but that's just an intellectual... No, that is, that's a great natural experiment, yeah. to sample populations that have more flip phones versus exactly. smartphones, yes. Exactly. We huh. mostly are only doing smartphones, it's either. But on um, conclusion, um, we kind of have some issues. We have some ratios. There's a ratio that has evolved here that's very, very interesting. I, I guess I have to show this anyway. My apologies for taking so long. But um, yeah, you got like 15 minutes. The point is, present analysis indicates something similar to Conrad. First, two similarities are discussed. Uh, first, Conrad argues behavior variable sensation seeking is unimportant by itself because the lowest correlation yeah, is school problems. We find that as well. So we have a very low correlation. Sensation seeking is not very important in mobile addiction, similar to her. Second, equal like Conrad, larger significant correlations were found between all the psychological problems. So we follow her on that. And that was, of course, anxiety into hopelessness and impulsiveness is the most important thing. I'll skip forward. Nevertheless, results are different from Conrad. The results show a uniqueness being an individuated additive and psychological addiction, as she would argue, at the same time for others, it's psycholo physiological chemical addiction. How do we know that? Because however, unlike Tavares' view, the results show that those who do have higher actual time use, they show higher psychological resilience. So we, we negate Conrad's idea because he would argue greater sensation seeking would be connected to all these psychological problems. And we don't find that at all. We find very low connectivity to all psychological problems for people who have admitted that they have higher time use. Therefore, high mobile phone time users fail to show major psychological problems. While those with many psychological problems, left hand of the column, tend to project that they have a mobile phone addiction without showing high correlation to sensation seeking at all. They, they assume that that's true. Particularly the claim, the physiological argument that higher time use should at least be strongly correlated with impulsiveness is not visible. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the bedrock of drug addiction. The bedrock of drug addiction is the argument that your external addiction makes you impulsive. We don't find a connection between impulsiveness and sensation seeking at all on the mobile phone, period. It is not connected on both sides. Um, so that makes mobile addiction very different in, than other models like that. And I guess I will close right now because I would like to hear some comments, but I will gladly make this uh, paper uh, available to people who want to read the draft or the PowerPoint. So it's, it's, it's an interesting switch. I'd like to go back to the, the data itself. Like that's really the key point right there. That, that those are six different indices that aren't really, you know, if, if, if Kadaris was right, if Kadaris was right, then all of these would be associated with high phone time use, but only one is. And they don't really have these psychological problems. For people that have an interpretation they have of a mobile phone problem, they are really not sensation seekers on the mobile phone at all. They are just impulsive and anxiety fueled. That's that's a very weird uh, uh, background there. We also think that this is an interesting ratio. It's like nine one one one. This this ratio of nine to one to one to one may be a, a diagnostic for whole populations of how you might test that hypothesis in another sample. If you find 9111, you may have a similar universal sense of this bimodal addiction. If you find, well, I forget what it was, like 2635 or 2735, I forget what I chose. But if you find that, you're probably gonna have a population with characteristic that's more like, that they interpret their phone problem and therefore they're more impulsive full of anxiety on my Just following up on Joe's observation, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm li listening to your presentation and thinking about all of this, and as a communication scholar, you know, hu human beings are um, information processing mm -hmm. uh, beings, and uh, 
So the question I have is, among your 120 questions on the survey, did you have questions that differentiated the different types of content that people might be? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we, do. we haven't even you haven't broken that into the analysis. We haven't broken that vein. Because, yeah. because that obviously, I mean, the implication of his question is right. the same thing I'm wondering. See, yeah. it's, no. I'll talk to you. It's too long. Yeah. Mobile, mobile games oh, right. being maybe the fastest rising content mm -hmm. category in, in mobile communication. Because mm -hmm. it's video, it's competition, it's all these things bundled into mm -hmm. the one. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that would be a really interesting. Uh, yeah, Joe's idea of finding some natural experiment, but those natural experiments are disappearing fast. Um, Japan probably the best place to research that because they still have a lot of flip phones. But even their flip phones had the internet before smartphones did. So it's going to be very hard to do a sample. You have to probably choose a sub-Saharan African country to get that data. And you know, that window of opportunity is fast disappearing. Even Kenya's 50% smartphones this year. Um, even but other, but how, how many content-related questions did you have in your survey? I'm not sure I was broken down by number, but quite a lot. Because that was one of the issues we, we thought. Because similar to Conrad, we thought, well, are people you know interested in different kinds of content on the phone? In other words, you're not addicted to the phone; you're addicted yeah. to some service on the phone. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what we're. That's a hypothesis that can be tested with a lot of our customers. Mm -hmm. We talk about gaming. We talk about do you like social media? Yeah, do you yeah. only lurk? Do you lurk and not yeah. post? Are you constantly posting? And which yeah. particular behaviors are associated with those? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of things to mine. There's 120 questions, and we just probably combed out 30 or 40 of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But it, what was so striking? Why I became lead author? This this was shocking to me. I was you know, that even you know even on the smaller samples, um, you know even on samples where they're really small. I mean now we're getting to 200 right here, like 200 or so in the sample. But still, nonetheless, these are p-value point zero one. These are very strong findings for even small samples. Um, at the same, they have exactly the same ratios across root versus ABCD. What's the status of the article? When will it? Uh... Mm, it's in first review at Computer and Human Behavior. So but you haven't seen reviewer comments? No, we haven't. They've had it for about two months now. Uh, yeah. But this is a very polished version of something else. Previously, we had multiple sections, so we carved it down to one big thing, dealing with testing Conrad's idea and interesting findings. We also had sections about uh, school outcomes themselves. We had sections about resilience, but that was too much for one place, so we just made a short article. It's about 25 pages. Uh, single space, but has lots of charts, and we, we're trying not just to, we're trying to do three things. One, introduce a new survey that's useful for more sociological analysis, not just testing one theory. Like most of the theories like Susanna was talking about, they assume it's all impulsiveness, so we'll take all the impulsive questions and just put, you know, I will ask them about that. This asks questions that's useful across many different hypotheses. So a new survey with demographic section. Second thing is we want to provide six different indices that are validated that can be used to test for other mobile addiction things. And third contribution is just these findings, these very robust uh, p-values on a lot of these correlations and our indices. Well, yeah. Diana, oh, yes. any comments? Oh yes, I was also having the same question yeah. that You're welcome to write a paper with us, guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Mark. All right, thank you. Thank you. My apologies, everyone, for this takes oh. so long, but I thought of this also as a history of those four different theories, as well as introducing myself and a lot of other hybrid things that I'm doing. Yeah.